us all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often to Bryn Baptist Church and our Sunday morning virtual church. First of all, just a short notice before we pray, more by way of a reminder that the church is opening again on Easter Sunday morning, 4th of April, service starting at 10.30am. Please come along if you can. Details on the newsletter. And if you haven't got a copy of the newsletter, give me a shout and I'll let you have one. Okay, so shall we pray? Heavenly Father, in your psalm it says, Enter into his gates, your gates, with thanksgiving, and into his gate, his courts, that's your courts, with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth is endures to all generations. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as we come before you, the Holy God, our Heavenly Father, it's with joy we gather to share in this virtual church, to share in the, the music and the ministry. In joy, we consider the Word of God and the salvation that is ours through the Lord Jesus Christ as we spend time together this morning. I wonder if you could like to join me in uh, reciting the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever 
and ever. Amen. Amen. And now I'll hand over to Phil. Privileged to be with you here in Bryn this morning. And even in these strange days of lockdown and limitations of fellowship, you know the Lord is still the same. Amen. And he wants to refresh, speak to each one of our hearts. I'd like to speak this morning uh, very simply, but yet from the, the, the depths of God's word. And I've got three headings. I want to speak about Passover celebration, about personal communion, and about proclaiming Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's actually the Jewish Passover right now, from Saturday the 27th of March through to April, the Sunday, the April, the 4th of June. So Sunday morning is the Jewish Passover. So we're going to read uh, three or four short passages from the scripture. I'm reading first of all from Exodus chapter 12, just two verses, verses 13 and 14. It says this, Now the blood, it says, I am the Lord, I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting covenant. Then over to the Gospel of Luke and chapter 22. Luke's Gospel chapter 22 and reading from verse 7. Luke 22 verse 7. It's good to follow things through in your own scripture so that you can be sure of the, the word that we're speaking from. Luke 22 7 then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed and he sent Peter and John that's the Lord Jesus sent Peter and John saying go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat so they said to him where do you want us to prepare and he said to them behold when you have entered the city a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water follow him into the house which he enters then you will say to the master of the house the teacher says to you where is the guest room that i may eat the passover with my disciples then he will show you a large furnished upper room there make ready so they went and found it just as he had said to them and they prepared the passover when the hour had come, he, the Lord Jesus, sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this, divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you amen we'll leave that passage there and i just want to just flip over to the epistle to the corinthians chapter one and we'll read that well-known passage that is read often at communion services from chapter 11 of hebrews 1 verse 23 for i received from the lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, 
which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as you drink this, as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. One last verse from the beginning of Corinthians. Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26. Sorry, verse uh, 25 I think it is. I repent of that. We'll go to verse 22. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Amen. Father, we just thank you again for your word this morning. Lord, we've already committed it, our time into your hands and we just pray now that you'll speak to each one of our hearts, our Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As I said earlier, it is the Passover, the Jewish Passover time. And I'd like to think for a moment or two about Passover celebration. The, the passage that we actually looked at there in Exodus, it was that when the Jews had been in captivity for 400 years, they'd been crying out to God, and God had sent Moses to them with a message of deliverance that the Lord was going to set them free from being captives, slaves, prisoners in that land. And he told them to take a lamb. Pharaoh had had warnings, it had plagues, it had the emphasis, the confirmation that Moses' me message to let my people go was from God. But he'd ignored it. And the final time came when the Lord said, this is it, they're going to lose the firstborn. And Moses gave the message to the children of Israel from God. Take a lamb, a yearling lamb, and bring it into your house for three weeks. Keep it in your house so that you have an, an affinity with that lamb. And then slay the lamb. What a, what a challenging thing to do. Slay the lamb and take the blood and paint it over the doorposts of your house. And then when the angel of death brings the judgment upon the land of Egypt that the firstborn are taken because of the rebellion against God's instructions. Then when that angel of death comes across the land, God said, I will see the blood and pass over you. And the angel of death passed over the houses of all, all the children of Israel that had obeyed the word and Egyptians who had heard and obeyed as well. And the angel passed over. And so Passover became a, 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 a time that they had to remember. A time that they were set free. And to, to have a Passover feast annually. And in fact it actually says that it will be an everlasting feast. That's interesting. Celebrating the freedom from slavery. And how they kept that feast, you know. They came every year at the day of pa the Passover time. And they would take, they, they, had, they had unleavened bread. In the Old Testament, leaven spoke about sin. And this was unleavened bread that they, they took. And they took wine. The bread, the unleavened bread, there were three layers of this unleavened bread. And there was a layer that was laid, and then it was covered. And another layer, and that was covered, and another layer, and that was covered. They took the three layers of unleavened bread, matzos bread. And that matzos bread, it was made and baked in such a way that it was striped 
there were stripes, cuts across it, and the, <coughs> there were the, <coughs> there were uh, holes that were poked into it, and they, they, those three layers, when they were having the, the feast, they'd take that middle layer. And they'd take that striped and pierced bread and they'd break it. And then they hid, they, they would hide that layer. It was hidden. Later, the youngest person that was gathered there had to go and find it. But it was hidden. You know, that striped, broken, pierced bread that was taken and hidden. To this day, the Orthodox Jews don't know what it signifies. But what a pointer to the one who came. And he was striped. His back was like a ploughed field. He was pierced. He was broken. This is my body broken for you, Jesus said. And he was buried. But praise God, he came out of that tomb. And he is alive forevermore. At the Passover feast, they took four cups of wine. And they, they, they were symbolic, they had a meaning. The first cup spoke of sanctification. You see, God was going to take his people there out of Egypt and make them his people, set them apart. That's what sanctification means, set apart to be the people of God. Oh, friends, are you, are you in that group? Set apart as a, 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 a person for God. The second cup was the cup of curses. It sort of spoke of the plagues, the cup of the plagues. The third cup was the cup of redemption. And the fourth cup was the cup of praise. You know, the Lord Jesus, he, as they gathered and had that first cup, the Lord took the second cup. He bore the curse. He took that curse. He took the plagues of sin upon himself. And he gave the disciples the third cup, the cup of redemption. Hallelujah. He paid the price to set them free from slavery to sin and to be the people of God. And he gave them the fourth cup to share to put the praise of God in their hearts. You know, the children of Israel in those days, they would have, well, not, not Moses' day because it came later, but later on as the children of Israel were remembering that unending feast, that uh, everlasting feast. They would sing together from the Psalms. They'd sing the songs of ascent. They'd sing from Psalm 113 and they'd sing through to Psalm 118. When the Lord Jesus Christ came into Jerusalem, it was Passover. And as, as, as the Lord came into the city, he may well have heard them singing some of those psalms. You know one of those psalms we sing here. We sing as believers. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. Friends that were singing about the day of redemption. The day of, uh, when atonement was going to be made. And those who were gathered in that, in that Passover feast didn't understand the depths and the significance of the word. But Jesus knew. And he gathered his, his disciples together with him. He told John, Peter and John to prepare a place for a meal. And when they went in he took the bread. And he took the cup. And the Lord Jesus spoke to the disciples as they were gathered in that upper room. And he took hold of that unleavened bread, that matzos, that, that wafer. And he said, this is my body that is broken for you. Friends, the wafer wasn't the flesh and blood. Jesus was standing before them. He was alive. He was there with them. But he was speaking of what he was going to do just a few hours later. This is my body broken for you. And in like manner... He took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the remission of sin. All of you drink it. And he called his disciples to share in that Passover celebration with them. Because you see, when they came in together with the Lord Jesus and partook, the Passover celebration 
became personal communion. Hallelujah. They were sharing in the life of Christ. You know, the Lord Jesus wants us to do that as well. He wants us to be his disciples, but to be his children and to have fellowship together in Christ. We read from Corinthians, you know, the Apostle Paul wrote the epistle to Corinthians. And Paul knew the significance of this feast. He knew it. And he knew it by personal revelation. Because you see, he hadn't actually been in that upper room with the disciples. He wasn't even a believer then. Not only that, he was writing to the Corinthians. And the Corinthians weren't Jews. They were Gentiles. But the same Lord Jesus Christ who died for the Jews and died for the Gentiles. And Paul was writing to them there. And he said this in verse 23. He said of uh, 1 Corinthians 1. He said, well, he, he, uh, sorry, 1 Corinthians 11. He, he spoke to them and he said in, uh, in verse 26, Verse 23, forgive me. He said, I received from the Lord that which I delivered unto you. See, the message that he was going to share was personal to him. He'd not had it just from this teacher or that teacher. He'd been given it from God. God had put a message in his heart. This communion that he was speaking of was personal. And friends, it's got to be that with each one of us. We've got to come and enter into communion with God. And Jesus came to make that possible. It's great to have the breaking of bread. I've been talking about it this morning. It's good to do that in remembrance of the Lord. I've been to, I can remember three kinds of communion services, breaking of bread services that I've been to. And the first one was very ritualistic. Not only ritualistic, in, in a, a formal sense but it was such a tradition that people went through the motions and whatever and it was just tagged on to the rest of a service and there was no sense of the power and presence of God there and people well we've done it we've done our duty and and that was it the second I remember the, the first job I ever had after Bible college was in a rehabilitation center for alcoholics it was in Scotland, way out in the sticks, miles from anywhere. And, and uh, I was spiritually hungry because we were out there isolated and whatever. And the local church of Scotland, which was run on a sort of Presbyterian basis, they had communion services. Mm, I th I'm not sure whether it was once a year or once a term, whatever, but it was it was it was sparsely uh, spaced. They, I think it may have been once a year, I'm not sure. But it was, the people came, the church, this building was on a hill and there was no houses running for miles around, but the farmers came and the people came and they came to that service. And as they came with their Bibles and their Sunday dress, you know, there was an absolute a, a, an awareness that they were coming to break bread they were coming to remember the Lord's Supper and there was a reverence that was there that blessed my heart the organist had an old pipe organ in the corner and the organist played fugues sorry he played Bach's fugue in D minor and he, he, the, the, the building was sh shaking it was rattling and it was thrilling it was making my heart shake as well it was precious and I was conscious of the reverence that was there. You know, just last week I was at another breaking of bread service. Another occasion of celebrating the Lord's Supper. That was different again. I had to stand behind this glass screen and all the rest of it. Praise God there's none here. <laughs> but then, <clears throat> then I can see at the back of the hall where everybody's 20 yards away. <laughs> but... <clears throat> As we broke bread last week, do you know after they, we'd partaken of the emblems, quite spontaneously and genuinely, people began to pray 
and they prayers were prayers of worship. They were offering up their thanks to the Lord and they were giving him the glory. And it was not a ritualistic thing. It was a, it was a spontaneous, precious, refreshing thing. And that, that spoke to me of that kind of a communion service too. Not ritual. Yes, reverence. But a response of praise and of thanksgiving. God wants us to be a people like that who respond to him. You know, the Apostle Paul taught the Corinthians about the significance of the breaking of bread. And he, he was speaking to a people who basically were from Sin Bin City because Corinth was that. It was a port that was that the, the sailors arrived nearby and took their goods there and there was buying and selling. It was a very um, international kind of a city. So it was prosperous, prosperous city. A lot of money that was there. It's also a pagan city. They had a pagan temple in Corinth. And it was also a very immoral city because by that temple they had the prostitutes that were there. And they, they even had signposts from the, the harbour for the sailors to show them where to go for the prostitutes. It was a decadent city. That's the kind of place that it was. But praise God, even in a place like that, the Lord Jesus Christ came and saved sinners. Hallelujah. Friends, he's a wonderful saviour. And he wants to be your saviour. I thank God that he's my saviour. And we gather to worship him even today. You know, Paul spoke to, to, to them. And he'd had that revelation from God. He'd had it about the Lord's Supper. He said, I share with you what the Lord has revealed to me. Where did he get that revelation from? Was it when he was on the Damascus Road? Do you remember the story? He was riding to persecute Christians in Damascus. God stopped him in his tracks. And he was prostrate on the floor. Blinded, helpless and in real need. And God had spoken and Paul cried out to God. Who are you? Lord. He acknowledged there was a Lord, a God in heaven. Friends, we need to do that to even begin. Who are you, Lord? And the answer came, I am Jesus, Yeshua, whom you are persecuting. Lord, what do you want me to do? Go into the city and it will be told you. You know, that was different for Paul, wasn't it? Paul had been used to telling everybody else what to do. But now he to listen and to be told what to do. I wonder if that's when God told him. He, I pass on to you what I've heard from the Lord. Was that when God spoke to him about the communion? Or was it further on, you know, when, when the Apostle Paul was preaching? He, he, <coughs> he'd been commissioned to go. And to speak about Jesus, to tell the, the, through the Roman Empire, men and women, about the Saviour. And he went to a place called Lystra. And at Lystra, he was sharing the message of Jesus. And God was confirming his word with signs following. There was a cripple that was healed. And God was moving. But you know, when God moves, the devil stirs up trouble. The devil opposes. Friends, when God moves, Satan hates it. And he seeks to rob men and women of the message of salvation. And in came troublemakers, religious ones at that. And they stirred up the crowds. And they took Paul. And they took him outside the city of Lystra. And they stoned him. And he lay there as dead. And they left him outside the walls of the city there was a <coughs> former days there was a Keswick convention speaker called Ron Dunn I think probably in this church probably some maybe all I don't know will have heard of Ron Dunn but Ron Dunn he shared that he believed that that was when Paul was taken up to heaven because Paul spoke he, uh, he spoke in 2nd Corinthians sharing with the Corinthians he said I 
I knew a man that was caught up to the third heaven and he saw things and heard things he wasn't permitted to share. I knew a man. Ron Dunn said he spoke about it in the third person, but he was speaking of his own personal experience. Was that when Paul received instructions about the Lord's Supper? I don't know, but I do know that he had them and he shared them with the Corinthian believers and their God's word to us today as we can remember. Friends, the Passover celebration that's going on now has become personal communion for every believer in Christ who knows the sin forgiven, knows that they've been born again by the Spirit of God. Passover celebration, personal communion, proclaiming Christ. You know, Paul went on. The Lord restored him, raised him up. He actually, what a man, what a God that Paul had. He actually went back into the city after that. He went back into the city um, before moving on. But Paul preached Christ. He said this, didn't he? He, he said, the, he spoke to the Corinthians. He challenged them about their lifestyle. He gave correction, in, instruction, encouragement and warning. He was proclaiming Christ. He said this in 1 Corinthians 1, 22, Jews look for signs, Greeks look for wisdom. You know the Jews look for spectacular signs to confirm the Messiah that they were expecting. Or their Messiah, he would work miracles, he would, he would feed the hungry, he would calm the storm. He would open the eyes of a man born blind. He would cast out demons. He would even raise the dead. And friends, the Lord Jesus did all of those things. And they still didn't see that he was the Son of God, the Messiah that they were waiting for. And they took him and they crucified him. You know, the Greeks wanted intellectual discussion. Some people like to talk, don't they? You know, Socrates said, oh, Plato put this argument. They wanted to reason and to talk uh, and to have all of this head knowledge and discussion about it. And Paul could have, he could have done all of that. But Paul had a commission from God. He said, we preach Christ crucified. Not the signs for the Jews, not the philosophy for the, for the Greeks. The message of a crucified Saviour proclaiming Christ. And Paul taught the Christians in Corinth about the Lord's Supper. But you know when he did that, friends, he wasn't talking merely about a dead religious leader. Because it says in 1 Corinthians 1.26, he said, do this until he come. Friends, Jesus is coming again. We gather, we feast on his word because we come to worship a living saviour. Not a dead religious leader, a living saviour. Hallelujah. Oh, friends, he's worthy of our praise and of our worship. You know, Jesus is coming again. He will come. He said so. In John 14, verse 6, he said to his disciples, I, Though I, I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, then you may be also. He said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. I'm coming again to take you to be with me for eternity. I'm coming again. You know, the disciples asked for the signs of his coming. And in Matthew 24, the, the Lord, he, he said, they said, what will be the signs of your coming? The disciples asked. Jesus said, there'll be wars, there'll be famines, there'll be pestilences. COVID's a pestilence. There'll be earthquakes. Earthquake statistics have gone up uh, multiple times over the last years. The last, it's increasing the number of earthquakes. There was a volcano just the other week that they've been saying waiting 900 pound, um, years for 900 years and they showed this picture of this flaming mountain 
there'll be false prophets. Well, listen, just listen. Listen to the, the God channels. Listen to the news programs. Listen to the, the things that are being spoken of and shared today. False prophets. There'll be tribulation. Do you know that persecution of Christians has become worse in this century than it was in the first century? Friends, there'll be tribulation. And then it says there'll be cosmic signs. Signs in the heavens above. And then the sun comes. Hallelujah. The son of God. Jesus is coming again. He's a risen living saviour. And he wants to be your saviour. And he's coming again. And it won't be long. He's coming soon. Praise the Lord. One further sign that the Lord gave in Matthew 24 was this. He said, he said the fig tree. When the fig tree blossoms. The fig tree was the symbol of the nation of Israel. Friends, that's significant in prophetic terms, pointing to the nearness of the coming of the Lord. Israel that was scattered for 2,000 years with no nation of their own, were drawn back together, brought into the land, a sign that Jesus is coming. And the events that are happening in the Middle East today are significant. They're all pointers to the fact that the Lord Jesus is coming. But he's coming because he wants us to be a part of his everlasting communion. You know, he's coming. And it, there's going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. I haven't time to speak about that, that this morning. But you know, there's going to be a celebration of God's people when they share together. And meet the Lord. Hallelujah. And he wants you to be with them. That's why Jesus came. That's why we can share. That's why... The Passover celebration became a time for personal communion. A time when we can proclaim Christ and share his life together. May God bless you and encourage you and make you a messenger of his gospel as well. Amen. God bless. For us, how vast beyond all measure. Just
His wounds have paid my ransom. Thanks for watching all. I hope you enjoyed the video. If so, consider subscribing so that you'll be notified when we add new videos. Thank you. God bless. Take care. Bye.